before we uh, before we get started, I'd like, I'd like to take a moment uh, to read our read our land to share our land acknowledgement. The Grand Erie District School Board recognizes the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people as their traditional peoples of this territory. We acknowledge and give gratitude to the Indigenous peoples for sharing these lands in order for us to continue our work here today. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah for the approval of the minutes. And before we, as we get started, Sarah, I'm wondering, Ivan, if you would be um, so kind as to um, share the uh, uh, the slide deck with the group. Thanks, All right. Sarah. Will, will do. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, welcome, everybody. And we'll start the meeting now with uh, approval of last meeting's minutes. So hopefully everybody got a chance to look at that. Oh dear, thanks Nancy. Um, so is there, are there any comments about the minutes? Any changes? All right, would anybody like to move to approve the minutes? Jen? Okay, Jen moves to approve and a seconder. I think Nancy had her hand up. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay, Nancy. I can't see all the pictures. Thank you. And um, I just lost that. All right, so next we wanted to talk about um, is the debriefing the guest speakers. So this is talking about, uh, I've completely lost track of time if it was last week or two weeks ago now. <laughs> um, we had two guest speakers and we just wanted to, I think, do we have a slide to share of feedback? Yes, okay, perfect. Um, For the next slide. Um, this is feedback from the Microsoft Teams or Microsoft Forms that um, that guests filled out afterward. Sorry to interrupt. Is it, is it sharing properly? Yes. Oh, it I is. have control of it now. Do I? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I didn't realize that I could do it. Excellent. All right. Um, so I'll just give you a moment to read it. I think um, uh, so we had um, <clears throat> Dr. Singh. So the feedback basically overall um, was very positive and uh, that people felt that um, this information should be shared with more uh, with more people um, in our classrooms to let more people be aware of religions other than our own as well too. Um, so it was very good feedback. And he's an, he really was a great speaker. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Karen Gordon, was our first speaker uh, at that time on April 28th. I'll give you a chance to read. So she left us with uh, her website where we could sign up for newsletters. And I've been getting some of those newsletters recently. I can't say I've read them all yet because there's a lot of emails that come in, but they are there. Um, she also does have a TED Talk coming out um, and that is available for anybody to watch as well. I believe it has come out now. So oh, has it already come out? Yes. Excellent. See, that's why I haven't been reading the emails. Well, just, in the last, just in the last two or three days, I just got yeah. an email. Excellent. Yep. I knew that it was soon. I mean, so great. Thank you. Okay. And then talking about 
future topics. So looking at ideas for next year, possibly. Um, we had some feedback, a few people saying that they would be interested in learning about different faiths that are celebrated in our schools and in our communities. And um, another on resilience, encouraging kindness, modeling the conversations, parenting during the teen years. Um, and I know we have had speakers on that in the past, but there are parents of new teens since then. Um, so I, that would be another great topic. There are always new parents of teens. Uh, the importance of communication and active listening. Uh, mental health and learning to be kind. And then also an Indigenous speaker giving information on their beliefs, uh, their story, and so on. Okay, uh, before we move on, does anybody else have anything to add to that about the speakers? If you didn't have a chance to fill in the survey, this is a chance to share now. Susan? I, the only thing I think about is that the topics were so amazing and the speakers were so great. I was a little bit disappointed that we didn't have more people attending. And I wonder if some of those blasts would be good that day of because parents get busy and I think, you know, you have the best of intentions, but sometimes you forget. So I wonder if, you know, at 3.30 on the day of, it would be good to have a blast with the links going out because I think so many could benefit from both topics. Yes, um, I would agree. It's it that's I mean, that's the struggle with everything is how to reach people have the best of intentions if they've even heard of it. Some people like me don't read every email that comes in. So <laughs> if we're getting three or four emails about it, then that increases the chances that we'll actually read one of them. Um, I always read my GPIC emails. Don't get me wrong on that. But um, not always, as Christina would know, not always the day that they are they are sent. <laughs> so, um, but yes, I think sending out more emails and the day of um, would be great. I'm just going to mute for a moment. Just while well, Sarah's muting, I'll I'll just add. So from a, a school perspective, we've all we've also been engaging our engaging our principals in that conversation and asking the same question: Is how do we reach um, more people through our school communities in Grand Erie? We we did discuss that as well because I do agree with you. It was it was exceptional, and it would have been great to have 500 people there, right? And so we need to con that. I think that's something we need to continue to commit to work on. If, if that's I, I appreciate that. And I'm saying that more as a parent, because I just think as a parent, there was so much amazing learning. Yeah, exactly. I found the same thing, Susan, I was I, I was really listening from a parent lens, too. I found the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, all right. And we'll move on then past that. I did see your comment, Sarah, um, as well. Um, Sarah said she thought they were both great as well and echoed what Susan just said that would have been great to have more participants attend. So um, we'll move to our update from the board table. Thank you so much, Sarah. So at this time, we're going to take the opportunity to share some updates of, of, of the, some of the great and interesting things and, and current things happening across Grand Erie. Um, so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Susan. Thank you. So if you could just move the slide for me, Sarah, that would be great. Hopefully the white, can you see the one-stop grad shop there? I can. So the, this is really exciting. Um, hold on one second. I just had some notes and I've, <laughs> they're all of a sudden not working. So it's really exciting to have the one-stop grad shop where it's at King George Road School. King George School, um, they're partnering with the Brantford Police Service to provide grade eight students across the district a time to find their graduation without the hefty price tag of shopping new. So they're gently used. It's back after a two year hiatus and offers a variety of gently used formal wear, shoes and accessories free of cost. So organization, organizers are seeking donations, uh, which can be dropped off at the Brantford Police Station until May the 3rd. So that date has passed, but the shop will be open um, starting May 6th from 3.30 to 7. I guess maybe that's already done, Lisa. My notes are a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. 
But it's still a really great initiative. You can see the smiles on the faces of those in the picture. So if we can go to the next slide, that will be terrific. So the, so the school year calendars have been approved and an email has been sent out. It's been on Twitter so people can see that those calendars are out and you can start your summer planning. And if we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, it was really exciting to celebrate National Volunteer Week. So volunteers bring such a diverse experience to our schools for their learning, well-being, belonging, um, their role models and motivators. And it was really exciting to see the volunteers that were chosen each week. They were featured um, on Twitter, making a difference. So our social media, the website, and also Twitter is a really great source for information. And um, you will see some, some of the I'm sure it's just a small few of the volunteers that we have in our system, but seeing a few of them profiled, which is really exciting. And then if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, so Education Week and Mental Health Week fell from May 2nd to 6th. Um, so that's a topic that's really important to me as my day job is actually working with mental health and addictions for students. Um, so students, families, community members celebrated Education Week. The team did an amazing job getting people to connect, be active, take notice, keep learning and give all things that help bring that mental health and well-being to our classroom. So there's been a lot of really exciting things happening. And we actually had a presentation at board earlier this week about a school that had their own well-being club that came from students. So I think the students are starting to talk about well-being and how they can support each other and themselves. So there's a lot of great things happening at Grand Erie right now. So thank you for giving me a few minutes to share. Thank you very much, Susan. We really appreciate that. So as I might have mentioned at the beginning, um, unfortunately, Director Roberto is unable to be here today. She sends her regrets this evening, um, but she really wanted me to extend thanks on everyone for their ongoing support and participation. And a special thank you to Sarah Nickel as chair. Um, Sarah, we're so appreciative of, of all of the time in your leadership um, to support GPIC. Yes, I, I agree with the round of applause to you. You've done an exceptional job. And you know, I, I, I always, thinking about knowing that impact, Sarah, and, and, and you need to know the significant impact that you've had on Grand Erie in this role. So we thank you so much for this. So at this time, uh, Kevin and I are going to uh, take you through a few of the um, system and school-based updates. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, tutoring. So as you may or may not have heard, on February 17th, the ministry announced a new action plan for learning recovery. Included in this plan is a major investment in delivering comprehensive tutoring supports throughout school boards across Ontario. And the idea about the tutoring supports is that um, it is to focus on students at risk um, who have been impacted by the learning disruptions caused by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, the way the funding is being used is to provide tutoring um, to students uh, with support um, being given at schools from educational assistants and or early, designated early childhood educators. And how the funding is being used is that um, we're at schools, uh, the at ECE or the EA is working with a small group of students. We're trying to maximize that at, at five students. Um, the tutoring supports is happening either before or after school. And they're working on things like homework completion or supplementary activities to support their literacy and numeracy development. Um, and although I mentioned there's a five to one group ratio, in some cases um, we have a one to one ratio. So it's it's really differentiated based on the needs for students um, who would benefit from more um, from more support and that does include students with special needs um, and we are now we are currently investigating an online option a virtual option as well um, we obviously see there are many benefits to the in-person option but also recognize that um, for some families an online approach might also be um, valuable so there'll be additional information coming out on that soon the next thing I wanted to talk briefly was about about EQAO for elementary. So as uh, you may be aware, uh, EQAO, the window to complete EQAO opened up just last week on May the 4th and the window opens until June the 24th. So that gives schools uh, lots of time to to select the, the time frame that will work best in their school community. And we've really worked it out across Grand Deary that that different pockets of schools are doing EQAO at different times. Um, and then the, the, fall, the results 
will be available in early fall. Um, what is new about EQAO this year is that it is virtual. So what we've done across the system is we have um, uh, worked to coordinate ensuring um, that there are devices and headsets in every school to support students in the completion of EQAO. So I wanted to take you a little bit deeper into it. Um, and uh, the, there's some of the built-in tools. So having a virtual um, opportunity, there's a lot of tools that you can really build in. So the first one is text-to-speech. So what that means is if you press a little play button on the page, it will actually read the whole page to the students. Um, there's a zoom in and zoom out function. So it just like, you know, it makes the page bigger, it makes the page smaller. Um, there's a line reader function and you, you remember uh, back in the olden days if we wanted to, to follow a line we would just put a, put a little ruler underneath it so what this does is it kind of creates a border around the text so it really helps students to focus on that text um, there's a high contrast so you know how you see some people with a white print and dark screen and for some students that accommodation works better um, there's a highlighter feature an eraser feature a place for students to put their notes and a calculator and I think in this digital age for, for many students this approach uh, is really helpful um, the accommodations that we've had in the past for EQAO continue and they're available to all students um, they can have extra time quiet setting prompts preferential seating um, there, the same, same as in the past format, there is a, um, a questionnaire with the assessments and the students share their perceptions and attitudes, so that's the same. And the, the, the test com, uh, still contains a language component and a mathematics component. Um, the total time though has actually been reduced. So the total time, I think it's about three and a half hours and students can have more time if they're needed. So um, based on the feedback I've heard so far from some schools that are doing it, um, it's worked really well. Uh, and I think another important thing to, to point out for some of you um, who have younger students that are in grade three, although it's virtual, if you think of some of those little virtual hands in grade three, not everybody has the, the, the typing skills. So there is still an option for those longer responses for students to do a written response and, and, and send it in as a PDF. So as you can see with the with the tool, it's a it's a um, very interactive and, and working working well. Not sure if there are any questions about that. All right, so I'm just going to move on to a very, some other very exciting news. We're really excited is that the Ontario um, Science and Curriculum for Elementary has been updated uh, and with a real focus here on, on helping students to have the skills to think critically, to dream boldly, and to chart new pathways forward in our economy. So it's, it's great to have a curriculum that is responsive to who our learners are going to be in the future. Um, the five areas are in, in, the, in the curriculum are STEM, life skills, <clears throat> matter and energy, structures and mechanisms, and earth and space. Um, and the only one I really wanted to point out, because some of the, those areas are similar to areas we've had in, pa in the past, but within the STEM piece, it really is about the application of science and technology, and, and it really is related to um, real world issues in our changing world. Um, I think it's liking within work. Within the within the STEM part, they they're going to spend time doing engineering design processes, um, a really important piece on indigenous knowledge and perspective. So it's built into the curriculum. I think that's a really important part of the work we're doing as a as a board and as a system. That it, these this is not a separate piece. It's actually yeah, I, I I appreciated the applause on the bottom because that's right. It should be integrated into the the learning that we're already that we are doing with our students daily. Not and an, an add-on or something different that's not how it works um, contributions to science and technology there's an area on coding and an area on food literacy and climate change so um, you'll see more about that being rolled out in the fall at this time i'm going to turn it over to my colleague kevin who's going to share some additional updates lisa can i just ask with that um sure can. is it changing all of grades k to eight right at the or one to eight all at the same time in the fall Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it'll be a delivery for the for the entire curriculum piece. For Great. The entire, okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Good question. So wonderful. Great to see everyone tonight. Uh, I have the pleasure to speak to a couple different slides here. And so the first one is uh, the new revision to grade 10 civics and citizenships course, as well as a grade nine science. So in keeping with the elementary science, there's also a new uh, secondary science for grade nine. The Minister of Education issued a revised grade 10 civics 
and Citizenship course uh, that will begin this September 2022. This course is redesigned uh, to help students learn what it means to be a responsible, informed and active Canadian citizen, both within the classroom and in the communities they belong to outside of school. And then as well as I mentioned with the grade nine science course, a D stream grade nine science course, this course is part of the ministry's commitment to modernizing education with a renewed focus on science, technology, engineering and math. And so now for grade nine D streaming, we've got a revised curriculum for now science and math. And of course, as we know, with D streaming coming in for this September, that also includes uh, using a DStream method for all of the other grade nine classes uh, and those curricula we are hopeful will come in the future. Uh, but for now, those courses will be taught at the 1D, so the academic, with some uh, additional adjustments for educators to be able to differentiate according to the uh, students that they have in their class. I saw a hand pop up, but then I don't see it right now. I'm not sure if you have a question about that. Jessica, do you have a question? I did. I just want a clarification on what's DStream. Great question. So uh, what we've been used to for quite some time within Ontario is different streams of education. So uh, back when I was in high school, uh, it was uh, advanced, general and basic. Uh, and now, of course, it's academic, applied and essential. And what it was forcing, and I'm using that word intentionally, forcing all of us to do was to pick a stream according to the ability that we or in the cases of educators or parents felt that students would be most successful in. And uh, what they what we found and uh, researchers have found over time is it disproportionately streams students into pathways that are not necessarily suited to their abilities. So in other words, uh, disproportionately underserved, underrepresented students uh, were placed into streaming levels of essential or applied, uh, which were not appropriate for the level of which they could achieve. And um, over time, of course, for students to be streamed, that puts them at a, a disadvantage for any learning opportunities in the future. And so as we continue to move through and learn through education, this adjustment to be able to create a de-streamed environment supports students without having to be placed into a streamed environment. And uh, I, I think one of the pieces on here is that we know even in elementary school, there is no streaming. And so for a lot of this, the learning, uh, as is usually the case in our schools, the learning is for adults because we were used to streamed environments. Our elementary students, as they come through elementary, they don't know any different. They're, they're used to learning with the students in their classroom. Uh, but for adults, uh, for myself, for many other individuals, to learn what it means to have a de-stream environment in secondary, uh, it, it, I actually look at this as, as cause for great excitement and learning and being able to adjust and change to meet the needs of our students. And of course, with that, the ministry's created three priorities that go with de-streaming, one of which is to identify, dismantle systemic uh, racism, uh, as well as all other structures that were in place as a result of a colonial educational system. So that's the first goal. Their second goal is to be able to uh, provide professional development, build uh, sustainable uh, and credible instructional strategies for our educators to support student centric uh, approaches. So that would include things uh, we've seen learning for all documents. If you if you, if you know the special education uh, ways to be able to support students, so learning for all document speaks to universal design for learning, differential instruction or differentiated instruction. So those instructional strategies are part of the training for our educators and they're getting that right now with respect to the math curriculum that will continue as we move forward. And then finally, um, having high expectations for student achievement is also part of the expectations and the goals that the ministry have placed under de-streaming. So when we see revised curricula that also speak to that, it's an exciting piece to see uh, a change in our curriculum that meets the needs of our students across not only uh, the province, but specifically within Grand Erie as well, because we know that our instructional strategies and our techniques are tailored to the students we see in front of us, not just teaching to a textbook. I'm That's awesome. That's quite different from when I was learning back in high school yeah. a long time ago. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I saw another hand. 
that went up. Yeah, I got mine up. So you said that the the streaming is based on the academic or advanced. Is that what they're teaching? I uh, believe. Are you referring to the other courses? So right now like we math, have the math right now. So math and now soon to be science have revised curriculum. Uh, that is D stream. So in other words, it's been totally rewritten and redone to uh, support a D stream environment for the other subjects in grade nine. So that would involve our English, our geography. Um, yeah. Those no, are the ones. What, that have been... So my Oops. question was like, is it like, are you take like, okay, so I had my grade nine in math this year. She's really good at math. She also had, there was two running parallel to each other. Her math was super hard. And like, even like just the stuff that they were learning blew my mind. But then the other class wasn't learning the same things. But they were both distreamed learning the same thing. Class uh, mediums were different, like for their, uh, for what their grades were. So I'm just wondering, like, if it was really looked at, like, is it of the teacher maybe, or, or is it just too hard? Because, like, she did well, like, she still did a really good grade, but if she in grade 10 is now a normally an advanced student, now she's kind of going, well, math was really super hard, so I'm going to drop down because that was too hard. So the original plan, there's a couple of different pieces I'll speak to and what you just mentioned. The original plan with de-streaming from the Ministry of Education, now they didn't actually assign timelines to it, but they did indicate that a de-streamed environment would exist or continue into grade 10 as well. And that as students choosing their stream, whether it would be through to university or through to college, workplace and so on, actually wouldn't be done until grade 11. The Ministry has not identified that timeline yet. And so as you're seeing for your daughter, when she's choosing a course for grade 10 next year, it would be at the academic applied or essential level. Um, to speak to the different courses, and so I, I, well, actually I'm still a math teacher, but when I started my career, I was a math teacher. And uh, multiple times I would teach two classes of the same grade, same, same like grade 10 academic math type of an example. And I would always find that the different classes would have different medium or different averages because they're two different groups of classes. And as I said, when it comes to instruction, you're really meeting the needs of the students that are in front of you. And when we try to identify or define success by the grade of which they're they're achieving rather than the content and the understanding that our students have, sometimes we get lost in the number. Um, and then we're trying to compare one class to another class when in essence each student is unique. And so as a educator, you're you're trying to meet the needs of each student and trying to identify the success in each student, because as we know, a 90 could be a success for one student and for another student, a 55 could be a success based on uh, the work that that educator is doing with that student. So I, I, I found earlier on in my career that comparing one class to another class actually was not fair because they're two totally different classes made up of different students. I don't know if that's necessarily addressing any question that you might have, but it was definitely an observation that I made as a classroom educator and when I saw two different classes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I was just like, just moving forward, I hope that they're gathering information, making sure that it worked because I was one of the original distreamed grade nines years and years ago when they realized, this didn't work. <laughs> so I want to make sure that yeah. moving forward, it is going to work. Well, that's great that you raised that. So you're exactly right. Uh, that was put into place uh, quite some time ago, actually not too far ago. Um, but there were a couple different learning points that were raised from that. Uh, and one of those pieces, as I'd mentioned, the ministry had outlined three goals for de-streaming. And that second one is around professional development and support for educators. And so that's what we're seeing right now. Um, through Superintendent uh, April Smith and our program team and all of our amazing educators that support implementation of curriculum. Um, they are doing a phenomenal job at supporting educators to learn what it means 
to teach in a de-streaming environment. And so that's a big difference compared to what had happened um, uh, previously. But thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any other questions? Okay, I'll move on to the next slide, which is speaking to project search. So Grand Erie is proud to support project search. It is a 10 month secondary employment preparation program for students with a primary diagnosis of an intellectual or developmental disability who are in their final year of high school. The JBLC, so the uh, Joe Brandt Learning Center, is hosting an information night, uh, or did host one uh, last week, and provided information to interested individuals uh, on the program to help students reach their employment goals through three co-op uh, or cooperative internships at a host business. Uh, and they're looking at St. Joseph's Life, Life Care Center and uh, Sedman uh, Community Hospice. And they're uh, combining this with training and employability and life skills, along with employment planning in support. So it's a great opportunity for students uh, who are, have a primary diagnosis of an intellectual or developmental disability and provides uh, some real life employment skills on the job. So co-op based, uh, fantastic opportunities with community partners. And our grant. Sorry, I do have a question about that. I just couldn't find my unmute button apparently. Of course, yes. Um, so just out of curiosity, this, that's a really great program, I'm sure. Um, I love seeing that. I'm wondering if it is also in Haldeman and Norfolk, or is it just in Brant sort of as a trial thing now? So right now, from what I know, and I apologize, I'm not an expert okay. on this, I'll say that right now, but from what I know and what I've learned is right now, this is just in Brantford. Uh, a lot of this is also just looking at the viability and how well it works. And I would imagine as we continue to acquire more community partners, because a lot of this is partnered with our communities, um, uh, it, there could be a potential to increase that. But I I, I would say not for the minutes. I, I'm not 100% sure. So that yeah. could be something that we could look to in the future. No, that's great. That's, I mean, it's, that's really good. And I think that once once it's it's been done for a year or two or something in Brant and Brantford that they'll have enough information to share with other community partners in the other counties as well too. So that's great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. So our Grand Erie graduation rate, and we can actually go to the next screen. Um, our multi-year strategic plan has a goal and our goal of course is to prepare every student for the post-secondary destination and then our five different destinations apprenticeship community college university and workplace and so the next screen actually displays some statistics and as a math person i love statistics so i'll walk you through this a little bit uh just speaking to students with an ossd within four years so there are two columns on here we've got province grand Erie, and then our four-year grad rate and our five-year grad rate and so for the students who graduated with an ontario secondary school diploma within four years of starting grade nine it remained steady compared to 2019 uh, we do know that from between 2018 and 2007 or sorry, 17 2020 there was a 1.6 percent point increase in our four-year graduation rate for Grand Erie District School Board and and this could be attributed attributed over the last couple of years to innovative programs credited with helping to improve our graduation rate and those include um, in line with our graduation strategies our special high school major programs dual credits our graduation coach programs uh, we also know that through this indicator provincially the students who graduated with an Ontario secondary school diploma within four years of starting grade nine increased by one percent um, compared to 2018 so the same type of increase we've seen provincially we're also seeing locally as well and a student uh, is considered four-year graduation or a graduate if they receive their Ontario Secondary School Diploma within four years, of course, of starting grade nine. The next column over is speaking to the five-year grad rate. And for students in Grand Erie, uh, those students that uh, had completed high school within five years of starting grade nine, 
that increased by four percentage points compared to 2019. And uh, from 2018 to 2020, there was actually a 4.5% increase in the five-year graduation rate for Grand Erie. And again, uh, attributing a lot of this success, of course, to the hard work of our students, uh, but also through programming of our specialist high skills majors, our dual credits, and our graduation coach program. So we have been seeing some considerable increases, but I can also speak to a lot of the hard work that's already been put into this current school year in terms of supporting students across the district as they reach their goals of graduation. Thank you. There's a question in the chat, Kevin. Okay. Um, it says, incredible jump from four to five year. Why do we think our numbers are so low compared to the province? Uh, <laughs> So I, I was going to say that that when we look at graduation rates, I, I'm actually going to piggyback a little bit on when I was talking about different um, different success rates in classes. So so every year is a different cohort of students, right? A different makeup of students, different makeup of needs, aspirations, goals, backgrounds, and so on. And so as we continue to learn more about students and create more of a student centric approach, so rather than that. And, and I'll say old school approach of uh, just teaching out of a, a textbook and students are just sort of following along. We're doing a lot more creative instructional uh, strategies that actually support each student as they go through. So we are seeing an increase and provincially they're also seeing an increase. But we also know that within our district, we're still learning every year. We learn about our students. We learn about the programs that are needed. We're trying to reach more students across the district uh, to account for the difference between the province and Grand Erie. I'd also speak to there is a difference between students that are living downtown Toronto and students that are, you know, living in Simcoe or living in Dunville, right? We There is a difference, um, but I I can speak to at least from this school year, we've been doing a lot of work around understanding who our students are and trying to meet their needs. So bringing the learning to them and the programming to them. Uh, we saw that with our option sheets, the types of courses students were selecting. Uh, we had an increase in some of our online offerings as well because of the desire that some of our students had shown. So as we continue to bring the learning to the students and support them, uh, we'll continue to see an increase within Grand Area District School Board. Thanks, I think I had a similar question to Melissa, so I appreciate that answer, thank you. So at this time, we'll turn it over to you, Sarah, for some uh, chairs updates. OK, uh, so um, there's not much more to report on than we've already talked about. Uh, so we're going to move right into the grade eight to nine transition discussions. This is kind of um, what we're going to be spending a good deal of time talking about tonight. So I hope everybody brought some ideas to share. Um, I think that we are going to break into groups. Uh, are we? Yes. Yeah. I think, um, Sarah, just to make sure lots of voices can be heard, we've yeah. got a smaller group today, so I think we'll just do two breakout sessions if that's okay. Uh, does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so what I was thinking we could do is we could break out into our smaller group sessions for about 15 minutes, and then we would come back as a larger group and share the, some of those bigger nuggets. And as well, um, there will be a recorder in each of the, um, there'll be someone from the team to help facilitate, and there'll be a recorder in each of the group, and then we will share forward. Um, we won't go through line by line, so we'll share forward the actual documents uh, um, so that we can collate that. That sounds wonderful. Perfect. So at this time, Christina, we would be really appreciative if you could put us into our breakout rooms.
Jason, do you want me to put you in a room? have to build an environment for these kids to want to be there day in and day out and to and to and to really take risks in their learning and feel comfortable in knowing that everybody is there supporting each other so i really i really appreciate that that's really awesome okay is there anyone else that wants to to speak to that first one or are we are we ready to move on to the second I just had a quick question for Melissa. Do you think going to the um, SCSs first made a difference too? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I think we could market ourselves a lot better. I'm in sales, so I feel like the the school board in general does a very terrible job um, of marketing what we have to offer. 
Um, I feel like it's a business and it doesn't get treated that way. And uh, I think we could really shop ourselves a lot better. Uh, and I'm going to stop there. But yes, go first. So oh, appreciate I'll just, the feedback. I'm just going to add to number one, being a former elementary transition teacher and also a parent choosing a high school for their child. I chose the high school because I received a lot of correspondence from the school. Just like you said, they did a really good job at getting me prior information. I saw their guidance department. I had a very good idea of what to expect for my child when they were going, and it was McKinnon Park that they were going to. So I think that that was something that was really helpful to me as a parent in choosing, and um, I think I chose well. Awesome. Okay. Um, since we only have about 15 minutes, we better move on to the second question, but we could keep talking about that. That's, uh, but we got some really good stuff there. Okay. Um, number two, how can we create early transit transition experiences for students and families? So I'm, I'm, when we talk about early, um, I, I guess that's open for debate. What is considered early? Go ahead, Sarah. Um, so I would say um, one of the things when my daughter was maybe in grade two, um, a band came from SCS to her, our elementary school. And at the time she was just enamored of it and said, you know, that is where I want to go. That is what I want to do. Now, of course, things have changed <laughs> over the time. She's still going to the same school, but she's not as excited about the band. But um, that really, that sort of, I think, cemented in her brain, you know, that is where I want to go. Uh -huh. So I think having the schools come out for bands, for orchestra, for sports, or invite um, the elementary schools to the high school. I know we were just there for a basketball tournament, um, but something that might involve a high school team going to watch a high school team or something along those lines, too. Yeah. Yeah, I've always... I've always wondered, um, you know, about um, what what students are prepared for at each grade level, because you, you see a lot of grade eight classes where teachers will engage with their kids and, and, and there will be a lot of talk about what's going to happen next year or what's going to what they're going to be expecting next year. And you wonder, you know, if that conversation and talk starts earlier, you know, how much. Um, how much that will affect, um, you know, a student's preparatory kind of thinking moving forward, right? So um, I, I, I kind of like that. Any anybody else have anything that they want to include in that section? I think I'll agree with with what was ex was expressed that it begins earlier than grade eight. You know, even going back to grade six, students mm -hmm. have a good idea in grade six of where they 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 think they want to go. But I think what's even more important than that is those visits to the post-secondary institutes and what is the high school that's going to best prepare them for those kinds of things. Looking at those pathways back in grade seven because they may not be choosing the high school that's going to prepare them the most and what their interests are. Mm -hmm. And I think interest surveys beginning very young is really important. Wow, that's 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 good. And it does happen, like it does, we do get grades seven and eights, they get invited to many post-secondary institutes in grade seven and eight, they take a lot of trips and do that. So I think that's really helpful in being involved in those kinds of things. So kids have an idea of where they want to go. Yeah. You know, Robin, I just wanted to add to that one, um, speaking to a group of principals a couple of weeks back. And one of the things they said is, and, and again, we celebrate all pathways, but interestingly, though, um, it, some students just don't even know what those pathway are, options are. And as you said, that starts really early and students okay. might not see themselves a vision for themselves as a as a as a truck driver or as a college student or as a, you know, a, a workplace. And by doing that early, it really helps them to to solidify. So it was a oh, big yeah. one. And then you'll still have children that are in grade 12 and still don't know what they need to do. I have a, I have a grade 12 child Absolutely. myself um, where he's, he, he's chosen skilled trades, but 
up until not long ago, he was off to college or university and total 360 in what he chose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I know that this is really kind of piggybacking on the third question, and I see that Lisa's already kind of taken a piece of what we talked about uh, with the first uh, with the first question and kind of incorporated into the third. And um, perhaps I can get the the ball rolling with this question. I'll I'll offer um, um, a perspective that really affected affected me um, as an administrator, as a school administrator. Um, so uh, I've had the opportunity to be in uh, in more than one school, and um, I, I noticed that with a particular school that that I was at, there were a lot of preconceived notions about certain uh, schools that uh, that they could choose to go to, and it was really fascinating to me um, when we started to market um, certain. Um, aspects of certain schools. So for example, um, at Pauline Johnson with the hospitality program, um, I mean, the amazing work that that school is doing with um, uh, with teaching and, and engaging children in, in, uh, in, in the hospitality, the cooking and the chef industry, um, the, the sports facilities and the, and, you know, the SOAR program at BCI and all of that stuff that um, really, uh, or sorry, PJ, um, all of that stuff really um, uh, needs to be marketed to the to the schools um, so that kids are making choices about where they want to go, like, like was mentioned earlier, but where is the place that's going to really allow me to, to spread my wings and grow as opposed to, I want to go to this school because my friends are going, right? So, Let's let's continue that conversation. What what do you guys think? What are other things that um, uh, parents, guardians have for pre-September transition experiences for your child? Or what suggestions do you have? Can you uh, say provide more visitation to more schools? Because right? I think that's important. Because just like you mentioned, you know, as a, as a transition teacher, I got to go to all the schools. So I did visually see all schools, but how many parents get a chance to do that? You know, go and walk in every school. Most kids choose one or two schools that they will visit before high school. So I think that that, well, do you, do, do elementary students have a choice in Grand Erie of which high school they really don't do that? There is flexibility, Robin, especially, flexibility. you know, in, sometimes in, uh, in in Haldeman and Norfolk, by by nature of distance, there's not as much flexibility, but within Brantford, for sure, there is. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if they're by yeah. district. But I do think it's it would be good for them as children to visit more, you know, and do more prior to to making their choice when they get early into grade eight, they have to make that decision by December in grade eight. So, so Robin, are you, are you, are you thinking about things like, um, uh, like a class, uh, like a half day? I know that they used to do this before, like a half day class trip to a high school where, uh, there are, um, uh, student ambassadors in grade 12 and 13 or what, or grade 12, <laughs> I'm showing my age, um, that, uh, uh, kind of facilitate, uh, a, you know, sort of like a, a a welcome to our school. This is what our school is all about so that it kind of gives them a little bit of an understanding of what they're going to be approaching. So, so I know they have shadow day, but children are usually only allowed to go to the school that they've chosen. A really unique thing that the transition teachers did this year is they did video presentations that a grade eight teacher could show on a variety of schools because of COVID, uh -huh. which yeah. I think is really unique. That gives the children more visual, um, that gets it, they can see the schools a little bit better. Uh, but I think that was helpful. The video presentations or something that were created by the transition team. I think that's really helpful. And I think we might run out of time, so maybe we better yeah. How, how do we create uh, a safe, welcoming and inclusive secondary school so all students can see themselves represented in their in their secondary school? And I think this really speaks to the inclusivity piece, and this is a real uh, a strong focus in our board. Right. So 
what what are your thoughts on this? I see a hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Um, so I, I would say that one of the things would be um, letting students know what some of the available courses are. So for example, um, we had no idea that one of um, our students' English classes were um, uh, based on a lot of Indigenous study. Um, and we had no idea until she started bringing home like short stories and things like that. Um, so we just, sometimes the curriculum can be a little overwhelming. Um, and so they miss the little pieces. Um, not that that's a little piece, but they, they miss the pieces that are um, maybe opening up their eyes more to something either that they don't understand, or maybe if we had a, an Indigenous student, maybe they would be, you know, really happy that other people are learning what they maybe already know. Um, so I think maybe just um, breaking down um, some of what the um, options are in, in the classes to, um, to help them understand that. If there's also, if a school has certain, um, you know, accessibility plans for students, like let's say they have a, a really wonderful layout for a student that may ha be differently abled, um, maybe, and, and I, I'm just, I'm not someone who can speak specifically, but um, I'm just thinking about things like accessibility for all. So those sorts of things might be something like we have, we have a lot of stairs at our school outside and maybe that's not awesome. Um, and uh, there are some levels where you can you can enter on a main level, but can you get to everywhere you need to go without an elevator, for example, is it convenient? So I feel like if there's a school that really shines in accessibility, um, that should be really showcased. Um, and that will be specific, right? Not for every school, but I think something like that is really important that if you have a location that is a wonderful school that just happens to have these other amazing features that that might be something that a student doesn't know exists for them. Um, and every school may have something different, but that just is what popped to mind for me. Awesome. I can go on on this one. Lisa knows I can. <laughs> so I say, I say students need to see themselves in the schools. There needs to be pictures, books, walls, culture, song, dance, music, arts, all, all cultures all nations, all abilities, all um, gender ideas, all um, identities need to be reflected. And that's what we refer to. All identities need to be visually seen within their school so students feel accepted. We just did PD on this, district-wide PD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think now more than ever, uh, really focusing on mental health is another uh, is another really important issue. A lot of our kids are coming with, you know, with with their own baggages and their own uh, life uh, histories that they're bringing uh, to, you know, with them. And and uh, and oftentimes, um, you know, they're asking for help without actually using the words. Right. So. We need to be more mindful of that and we need to um, really make that uh, an integral piece. That's my uh, my belief. So maybe that. mental health acceptance and differences. Yeah. And. Um, Individualities might be a better yeah. word. And I think student voice Help, helping students good. navigate through that, right? That's mm -hmm. the. OK, thank you very much for the conversation. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, we've still we've got I just uh, connected with the other group. We've got another two minutes if anybody wants to add. I know um, we did uh, number three. We might, we might have had some other suggestions because Melissa, I am interested. You, you really piqued my interest when there were some things you were thinking about in terms of the marketing, especially given your background. I think um, I think our websites are atrocious. I've thought so for years, um, and so I would I would I would start with that. Um, and uh, I mean, this is a whole other conversation I would love to have with anyone that has any sort of uh, ability to impact some of these things. But it it's it starts with it starts with that. We we've done a pretty good job at SCS working on our.
<laughs> no, we were having a good conversation this morning. Yeah, same here. Oh, I know what it what it was for number three, Lisa. We were talking about social media to meet the the young young changing minds. Twenty first century learning needs to really really need to push those social media platforms that I don't even venture into. Mm -hmm. I think that there might be some technology challenges tonight. I got kicked right out instead of going back into the main group. So some others might as well. Melissa, it looks like you did too. I think we all did. But, oh, okay. <laughs> the good news is it looks like we all found our way back. <laughs> that's right. That shows that it's a good meeting. Yeah, that's good. All right. Some incredible discussions. I tell you, Kevin and I um, are working with teams to do a lot of work on this background. And it was it's really affirming to hear some some common themes, but really exciting to hear some new ideas as well. So um, I think this is all going to help with a very robust plan. Kevin, did you or I would want to share a couple of highlights from your group? I can share. I was taking some notes on behalf of group number one. Number one. So <laughs> what I can say is actually a lot of great discussion and, and I was finding that I was trying to keep the notes within each question, but some of our answers actually could have been applied to multiple questions. So that first question was really talking about some of those unique experiences that uh, have been seen or, or maybe not necessarily by students of the parents right now, but have seen it take place. And so some of those uh, pieces around uh, Grand Dairy schools tend to have more hands-on options, uh, some really great ways for students to get involved. Really liked, uh, I, I guess at North Park, they have a program called the, the Link Crew. It's a mentorship program with senior students that support incoming students. Very, very well received. Not only is it a benefit for incoming grade nine students, but it's also a benefit to the senior students as well and giving them those opportunities to be mentors. Saw different uh, other positives as well uh, in terms of the school being a part of the community and the, having that community feel and that atmosphere. Uh, and really liked, uh, in some cases, some of those smaller schools and that smaller school feel that you may not necessarily get in other locations. So really, those were some of those unique experiences uh, that really uh, spoke to students attending a Grand Area District School Board. Did you want to say your answer to question one? Okay. Perfect. I was just, I would, thanks so much. I was just thinking that would probably make sense because we're on that. Yeah, so our group said some of the unique things um, was that just walking into the Grand Area schools and feeling that the atmosphere was welcoming and comfortable. It was interesting. One member of our group talked about, um, shared an experience of their child who was uh, thinking about going to to our coterminous board, but that that time going in to visit a school and that feeling that the, the, the tour guides were amazing. They felt safe. They felt comfortable. They felt a strong sense of community and, and those feelings in that visit actually made that decision. So which is interesting because we talk a lot about how important it is to to get kids early on to see them a vision of themselves in, in, in grand area and secondary. But it was a really important point to highlight, you know, some students still are thinking about that decision up until the end of grade eight. Uh, the other part was uh, even the timing of the school visit. So we had posed the question, well, you know, what do you think would have happened if they went to see the other school visit first? And that could have, you know, swayed them as well. So Grand Aries was first. So I think, you know, timing and, and getting out there early in the in the in the the process is good. And then uh, an, another member shared it, that Grand Erie does a great job of presenting what to expect when you come to high school in Grand Erie, and that really helped to make that transition smooth. So our second question was, how do we create early transition experiences for students and families? What did group one have to say about that? So this one actually speaks a little bit to what you're just saying, Lisa, in terms of those opportunities. And the wondering is about having more opportunities, not just for grade eight students, but grade seven students. Doesn't even necessarily needs to be labeled transition activity. In fact, there were some different ideas, those fun events, you know, whether there are those science fairs, sports, drama presentations, music, any opportunity to get students to come into the building, because actually further down in one of the other questions when it was talking around uh, creating more opportunities for pre September transitions, it was around getting more opportunities to get into the building to learn it because you know, you're, you're going from this smaller building where you know where you're going to this larger building that you can get lost in the halls. And so if you have more opportunities, grade six, grade seven, to come in to check out the school, 
uh, that just helps to build that confidence and that sense of community and atmosphere that we were speaking about before. So that was uh, one of those things. Other ideas such as getting timetables earlier to help mm -hmm. decrease some anxiety, uh, relieve a little bit of comfort on there. Uh, and then another idea too, which um, I was a part of in, in from my previous life there, uh, looking at from student success and guidance creating descriptions of courses, but having more information about it so that as students and families are reading the descriptions of courses that are a little bit more robust and give a better idea of what those courses are, especially for those students that are uh, choosing courses and they're not in high school yet and they, they, they want to get a little bit more information. So some great ideas. Thank you. Ours were similar. So we talked about that idea of, of starting really early. Um, one member of our group shared how when their child was in, I think it was in grade two, um, that when the, the band came and they said, that's where I want to go, right? So just, you know, having the secondary school come into the elementary school, but conversely, elementary school sports, we have a basketball tournament. Where do you have it? You have it at your local high school. You start to see that as a familiar place for your students. Um, another oh, interesting point that's just a little bit different, but, um, you know, and it's really leveraged a sort of a thread and a through through way for students all the way up to post-secondary and the idea was start to look at those pathways um, through the high school as early as grade seven and eight so not only does that let students see their their pathway through the grand area secondary school but also one of those bigger things that many of us who have had students um, you know go through grade 12 and a member of our group shared that as well that still wasn't sure what they wanted to do so that would really enhance that option as well and and finally the last thing we talked about were interest surveys in elementary school to have students really start to understand what their interests their areas of interest and passion are oh that's great and i think great. we have to and we I think we had a comment in the um chat box on this question and sarah shared yes that would be good just getting into the building for fun events would be great and so easy to do isn't it sarah um and sarah also shared my son was at the uh, at the paris district high school for track and field today and he thought that was very fun yeah, you know, we've got a, we certainly have a, a leverage point there, right, for our, our own schools. Definitely, definitely. So next one was, what suggestions do parents, guardians have for a pre-September transition experience um, for their child going into grade nine? So we had one comment, actually, it was talking about the rigor of being in high school and necessarily not having that in elementary school. So, you know, for, for in an elementary school to have pushing due dates and homework. And I think a lot of that is just around understanding high school and, and um, is it going to be harder? Is it easier? What what do I need to do? How much homework am I going to get? That type of a, a piece uh, and having a little bit more familiarity of what that would look like even when they're in elementary school. Uh, and then another piece around having some more tools to help decrease stress. And because we know transitions are very stressful experience when you're leaving one area that you that you may know very well and entering into this unknown unchartered territory as a grade nine student and so anytime that we can help to decrease stress uh, I think that we're supporting our students then in that aspect. Perfect. And, and our group talked about uh, video presentations. They had mentioned that the transition teams had done the video pre presentations um, that were being shared in the elementary schools to, again, give a vision of the secondary school um, and visiting schools early on. We also use this question as a little bit of an opportunity to talk about next steps for Grand Area, things that maybe we could enhance. And, and we talked about marketing strategies, um, websites, doing some work on the website and social media. So, um, yeah, I wanted to share that as well. And then finally, um, how do we create safe, welcoming and inclusive secondary students, schools, sorry, so that all students see themselves represented in their in, in the school? Yeah, definitely. And for this question here, uh, we had begun our conversation and then we sort of stopped. We got booted out. So, but we had a couple. Uh, the first one was a great example from North Park in the sense that uh, as you walk into that building, they've got welcome words from all different languages and students uh, as they attend. And so what better way to see yourselves than uh, a welcome word in a different language that perhaps might be your home language. Uh, and so that's a great way to be welcome when you walk into a building. Uh, also as well, when we're talking about safe, welcoming, inclusive secondary schools, it's really important to ask the students, what are they looking for in the building? 
uh, and to be able to respond to that, uh, to have classrooms that are more adaptive and respond to the needs of students. So really looking at that student centric approach uh, to ensure that the students see themselves uh, not only in the learning, but physically in the building. Perfect. And our group also talked about sharing course options in terms of in, with with an equity lens too. And one one parent shared that they didn't even know that there was an Indigenous Studies course until their st students were in high school. And how do we how do we let students know that before they enter the doors into high school? And I think you you also mentioned in your group um, that understanding course options in general was was an area of growth. Uh, we talked about accessibility at all and how do we, when we think about inclusivity from an accessibility point of view, there are some schools in Grand Erie that are, are, are very accessible. How do we market that strategy so students know, you know, some of the spaces that we can do that. Um, and very importantly, um, we know that students need to see themselves reflected across the school in the curriculum, on the halls, in the walls in the resources, in the curriculum, um, in, in ways of knowing, in ways of being. Um, and that's a really big point. Uh, a student voice is incredibly important. And, you know, how do you leverage that early so that students even, I'm adding, sorry, I'm added living right now, but that, that students know that their voice is going to be a part of their secondary school. What a powerful thing to think going into school that I have, I have a role in my education. What a, a novel thought. Um, and then also a focus on mental health acceptance and individuality in high school. Then we had a couple of thoughts in our in the chat box. Um, Sarah, uh, Susan had shared the, the idea of the virtual virtual tour, tours um, and, and sharing that they do that in the long term care system, which is what yeah, what a great idea. Um, Sarah had shared it would be great to have a shortened day before the school year starts in grade nine where incoming students can go through their day moving from class to class meeting their teachers and finding their way around the school before the student is full before the school is full of 10 to 12 you know of grade 10 to 12 students um, was when I was in high school the first year high school students started the day before the rest very interesting I think of you know how we do our kindergarten entry too right we do it as a little bit of a staggered entry and we do have the welcome to school program as well so um, it might have a slightly different name but again promoting that because it gives students an opportunity to get in that into high school before their first day of school that can be a huge anxiety piece um, Melissa shared, um, love that, love that, Sarah. We're always away with the week at the end of August. When you, oh, there you, sorry, thank you. Sarah has it right there. When you're invited to visit um, a Simcoe a pre start, Maddie um, in grade eight is relying on her older sisters, but love the orientation night. So glad we got it back this year. So that's great. And Sarah shared, I just had another idea. Maybe groups of high school students could go into the elementary schools for something fun like playing games or outdoor sports together. I coordinated something like this with Laurier students in the after school programs and it was powerful. Um, Sarah, I, and, and sorry, and Sarah also said it would be great to have a shortened day. Oh, just concurring. So Sarah, I want to go back to that one about, about that because we all know um, and it, it is as great as our voices are, um, the voice of a high school student has a lot of leverage um, with elementary school students. So I think that's a great point, really great points. We'll make sure we capture that as well. Wow. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share too that um, it's it's not the same thing, but very similar that when I was choosing my post-secondary education, we had universities and colleges and stuff all at the school at the same time. And I went around and talked to a bunch of different ones. And literally the reason that I made the choice that I did, because I had, I think, three or four different ones that I could have chosen to go to. And the reason that I chose to go to Guelph was because the student um, ambassador who was there convinced me that Guelph was the best school. And of course, everybody was trying to convince everyone of that, but I still remember this <clears throat> many years later, that that was the reason that I attended that school. So having the student ambassadors from the high schools come in, it's great. Having the staff is really important, obviously, but having student ambassadors who love their school go in to convince them convince the the younger students why they need to go to this school um and just and i think the assumption that our students are going to stay in grand Erie, that the teachers need to talk and i think they do i don't think they often talk about going to our co-terminal board co-terminus board but i think continuing that that talk in the schools is just when you go to 
such and such a school, not if or whatever, but keeping it as a when you go. Well said, yeah. And Sarah, we talked about this with our principal group and we thought even even more powerful, not just, not just, but not someone coming in that you might not know, but maybe if it was at Agnes Hodge School, having someone at the post at the secondary school that goes back to Agnes Hodge. So it's someone that they know that they already have some trust with that can say, you know, I went to this school and this is what this, this experience has been for me. These are great ideas. Great yeah. suggestion. Thank you, everyone. Yes. So, oh, Jen, Jen, your hand is up. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, like for JL, we have field day and the high school students do come in and help the teachers with the events. But the only thing is, is the high school students kind of skip their day because apparently they can't use high school um, hours, like for their volunteer hours. So, yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if there could be something changed that way too, so that you you can have high school students kind of come in more because, you know, it it, it does make a, a difference that way, and it does bring up the teachers. The teachers are happy to see the students. Everybody's kind of happy that day. For sure, they are. So Susan asked, um, going back to Jen's earlier comment in the group, it sure would be great to ask students these same questions. Kevin, did you want to share? Because I think you've been working with some students on this as well. Is that is that correct? Yeah, so we we had a student senate meeting last last week now, and we were asking similar questions. You know, what? why did you choose Grand Erie? Uh, and what would you do differently? That type of a thing. And, and actually, when we were asking the students around um why did they choose their high school of course there are some answers similar to what we heard today in, in in some respects and from group one we talked about this too that sometimes geography it's the closest school it's close by i didn't want to get on a bus for 40 minutes that type of a thing but also heard from students that one of the main reasons why they chose a grand Erie district school is because of the atmosphere the climate the warm and inviting sense that they had when they entered into the building. We even had a couple students that came from the coterminous board who spoke about that feeling they had when they came in for a visit, that feeling that they had when they talked to other students who attended a Grand Area District School Board. And, and it's that piece that um, you want to be able to say, oh, we can you know, just do this, this and this, and then you'll create that feeling. But we also know that that's born out of a lot of our programming we have, our staff, our students who take pride in our schools. And the more we talk about that, and I heard a little bit about that too, right? That that sense of, okay, when you're in grade eight, you're going to go to a, this high school. You're going there because it's a fantastic school. Here are all the programs and so on and so forth. Because as our students then attend, they're picking up on that as well. And they really did speak to that positive nurturing, that atmosphere uh, that, that they really liked being in a Grand Area District School Board. So some similar comments, um, but it was really fascinating to hear them speak about that too. And I would even say, they didn't say this word, but their love for Grand Area District School Board. It, it was definitely evident in what they were saying. Perfect. Well, I, I think that about wraps it up. Are there any um, additional comments about that from the rest of the group? Sarah, did you have any final comments? Uh, I just see Melissa's just posted again. Oh, um, thank this you. Just happened. <laughs> Perfect. Says, I wonder if there's a way to model the VIP program in a transition to high school format. So Melissa, can you expand on that a little bit? Yep, I can for sure. So um, when the kids do their VIP stuff um, in grade, I think it's six, um, they, you know, they go to the courthouse one day, they have a police officer come, there's like a, a multi kind of um, multi session certificate program sort of where they get at the end, they're like, you're a VIP and all this stuff. But there's like different like it's like a five or six week session. So I wonder if there almost isn't like a, you know, you're on your way to high school sort of thing, if there isn't a way to make sort of like a, a multi session program, which is their transition piece, which is maybe a visit there, they come here, maybe, you know, the, the because not everybody is going to be into sports. Sometimes there's people that are into music and sometimes there's kids that are into art. And sometimes the kids that would do a great job touring aren't, aren't the ones that are this, the, um, you know, the student council heads because maybe they're a little more quiet, but they're still awesome. 
So maybe there's just a way to identify over those six weeks um, some ways to do that. And I, and I say that because I have a sports kid, I have a musician, I have a kid that's shy and doesn't want to talk to anybody. So, um, and they would be good ambassadors. It's just that they're not the person that's going to be standing on the field yelling, um, but they're going to love the school to bits. Um, so anyway, that's what I meant. Thanks. I, I'm glad, Melissa, that you you expanded on that because I, I wasn't quite sure. And that's a, a really, a really interesting idea. So we'll be sure to capture that in our notes as well. So uh, we just want to thank you so much for your, seriously, your very, very thoughtful and I think important feedback. And I and I hope as we go forward, you'll 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 see some of these ideas uh, come to fruition. Um, and you know, some are in place, but we we certainly have some areas for growth for sure. So at this time, um, Sarah Nichols, I'm going to ask: Is there anything additional that you wanted to share from the group with the group? Uh, I don't think so. Um, uh, I appreciate everybody coming out to each of our meetings this year and in years past. And I, um, I will let you all know right now. I will not be running for chair next year. So, um, if you people who are here now want to start thinking about whether that's something that they might like to do, if you want to reach out to me. I can share with you um, if you if you can't tell already what I do, um, and uh, I would love to share more information. Um, and I I hope to be able to still attend GPIC meetings. I just uh, I won't be, it won't be in the chair position. Um, so I do appreciate everybody who has been coming out and supported um, the pick and uh, and myself as well. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah and Kevin. I want Kevin and I and, and Susan want to we want to echo that as well. We're so appreciative of uh, of everybody's time. We know that this is an, some extra time um, that everybody's put in, and, and Sarah, you as chair as well. Um, I, this is my first experience uh, being on GPIC, and I have to tell you, I, I it has been phenomenal. Um, I, I look so forward to these meetings, and you don't look forward to every meeting. Uh, you know, there's lots of people in the world. What really, Lisa? <laughs> it's it's been exceptional, and and probably one of the most inspiring parts of my job. So thank you. You all for your commitment yeah, um, you. have a wonderful evening and uh we will see you in the fall enjoy the beautiful outside that's right <laughs> thank you everyone thanks everybody bye Wanna.